Hey, it's your old pal Lucid Stew again, and this time we're going to talk about adding a super easy three camera cutscene to your dream scene. We've talked about optimizing with the Ancient Times assets so we can use them to make a larger scene. Now we're going to look at some things we can do to give that scene life. This series is not so much about gameplay, but more about sequences and action that you can add to a static scene you may have created in order to make it feel less static. The way we're going to do that this time is by adding a cutscene to introduce the player to a portion of the scene. That will occur between these two pillars, so I've placed a microchip in that area to organize the logic for the cutscene. The first thing we need is a trigger zone so that we can get the logic to react to the player being in a certain part of the scene. By the way, you don't have to do this inside a microchip, it's just a way of organizing gadgets and keeping things neat. Let's take a look inside this trigger zone gadget. The main things we want to concern ourselves with are the things to detect and the size of the zone. We, what we want is for the player to walk into the zone and generate a signal. In more basic terms, when the player is here, do something. The something in this case will be our cutscene. You can move the zone in the scene space by grabbing this white dot. Then you want to use the zone size sliders to resize the zone. Remember, the zone determines where the action is triggered, so you want to make sure it's placed in size to only trigger where you want the action to occur. Another thing to consider is sizing the zone in a way that the player can't avoid it when you don't want them to. In this case, we accomplish that by filling in the gaps between these pillars. We have the trigger zone placed. We want the trigger zone to activate a sequence. The easiest way to have a sequence run is with a timeline. We're going to connect the detected output tab on the trigger zone to power on the timeline. That way the timeline will only run when the player is detected by the trigger zone. The only setting we need to concern ourselves with on the timeline is playback mode. You want to make sure that's not set to loop. It will be on sustain by default and that's fine for cases where you're controlling when the gadget first gets power like this one. This is a three camera cutscene, so we're simply going to place a camera gadget into the timeline and then clone it a couple of times end to end. You want to make sure they're lined up. This determines when a camera is powered. If no camera in the timeline is powered, you'll revert to any other camera that might be and that will give you undesirable results. I'm powering each of these cameras for three seconds. We'll adjust that later. If you're not familiar with timelines, a gadget gets power in a timeline when the playhead overlays it. So even though these cameras will still be in the timeline, they will not have power after the playhead has gone beyond them in the sequence of time. And then ultimately the sequence ends when the playhead reaches the end of it. Now that the cameras are in the timeline, let's open one up and see what our options are. You have lots of things to adjust here, but the main things we'll concern ourselves with are transition type, transition time, and scene options like hide imp, disable controls, and black bars. We'll hide the imps very simply because we don't want to see them. If you do want to see them, don't hide them. We're going to disable controller sensor input because we don't want the player to have any influence over the sequence. We just want them to watch. If you want to give the player camera control or have an interactive sequence, leave this off. We want to do this for each camera so the settings are consistent during the entire sequence. Setting up cameras in Dreams is very easy. Press L1 and cross to enter the camera. Fly around the scene until you have the desired viewpoint and then exit. Now the camera is set there. Our first of three cameras serves to set the scene and indicate to the player that they no longer have control. Sometimes this is called an establishing shot because we're establishing the context in which the scene will occur. The camera will transition from the character camera position into the position of the first camera. Here I have audio in the scene about where the sequence would be triggered. You can see the context of the scene is that the player has entered the Valley of the Ancients and its wonders lay before them ready to be explored. Once we have the scene established, we want to use our second shot to show the player the lay of the land or to point out an area of interest. In this case, we're showing the player that a perilous crumbling stairway lies ahead. This second shot is the main point of the sequence. Our last shot will be behind the character, resetting the viewpoint to about where the character camera will resume. When we transition out of this camera, we will move forward into the character camera, thereby indicating to the player that the cutscene is over and that they once again have control of the character. 
Let's set RDO in place and take a look at how the sequence plays out so far. The trigger zone is functioning and we run through all three cameras before returning to player control. So that's good. However, we have a few rough edges that need sanding. One thing we can adjust is the way we transition between cameras. What works best will vary, but what I'm going to do here is switch our transition out of the character to ease out. This will come out of the character camera very quickly and into the first camera slowly, strengthening the impression that we're now in the scene, in a sequence, and no longer in control. It's important to note, when you set a transition on a camera, that is the transition into that camera. We're going to do the same thing for the transition between the first camera and the second because we want to spend more time showing the player the point of interest and less time continuing to show the establishing shot. The speedy ascent also helps accentuate that we're looking at the scene from above. On the third transition we have a long way to travel in the scene between viewpoints. There are a lot of different ways to do this, but since the purpose of the cutscene is complete and we want to get back into player control, we're simply going to cut to the new position. Another thing we can do to emphasize to the player that a cutscene is occurring is to activate black bars in each camera, and here's what that looks like. Now when we enter the trigger zone, we're met with a cinematic feel. It's apparent that we are in a cutscene. Overall, it's pretty good, but has some pacing issues, especially with the transition back into the character, so let's talk about transition times and camera duration. One easy way to address the lag at the end of the sequence is to have the third camera run for less time. Good cutscenes are very much about keeping the viewer's attention and keeping the camera moving. In this case, we'll, we'll eliminate two seconds of nothing happening for a better flow back into player control. Transition times are the amount of time it takes to get from one camera viewpoint to the next, and what works will depend on the distance between the two. In the case of our first camera and the character camera, they're close to each other so we don't need very much time to transition. The third camera has a cut transition, so time is instant regardless of transition time setting. The transition back into the character is determined by the character camera. And that is how you set up a simple cutscene. This series will continue with easy things like this that you can do to add interest to your static scenes. So until next time, I'll see you in the Dreamiverse.